Center for Russian, um, East European and Eurasian Studies, both of which are part of the University Center for International Studies at Pittsburgh. Um, this is co-funded by um, the Erasmus Plus Program of the European Union. Before we get started, I wanna make sure that everyone knows kind of some of the ground rules in terms of you are welcome to ask questions throughout the um, webinar and we'll try to monitor those questions and address as many of them as we can. Um, and before we get started, I wanna take the opportunity to thank the people who are behind the scenes um, who make the webinars work. Um, so I wanna thank Ingrid Gomez O'Toole and Kathleen Brett for helping this happen today. Um, so now I'm gonna hand it over to Gabby who will introduce herself and our panelists for today. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, uh, Stefano and, and Chuja for joining us today. We are really honored to have you. So just uh, two sentences about me. I'm a social cultural anthropologist who was trained as a Japan scholar. I spent my first 25 years in in, in, Buda, in Hungary and then I in Budapest and then I uh, left for graduate school and then I stayed in the US. My, uh, I work on gender, labor, and media. My first two books uh, are about Japan's commercial television industry and digital economy. Um, they came out from Duke University Press, but currently I'm working on a book about Hungary, which is about uh, the use of analog and digital media in uh, anti-government activism in post-2010 Hungary. I'm particularly interested in the place of women in anti-government activism and um, their contributions to discussions about the commons, uh, which I see as a key alternative to uh, or, uh, Victor Orb uh, what Viktor Orban calls um, uh, illiberal de democracy. So then I'll introduce our two uh, panelists today. First, uh, Zsuzsanna Salini, who was a foreign policy expert and former politician. She established the Democracy Institute um, Leadership Academy at the Central European University in uh, 2022, this academy develops curricula for curricula to support um, pro-democracy activists. Zsuzsa also served as a member of the Hung Hungarian parliament between 1990 and 1994, and then again from 1914 to 1918, as I realized always in opposition, which, which, is, which is interesting. And um, she published a book titled Tainted Democracy, Viktor Orban and the Subversion of Hungary, which was listed among the best books in 2023 by Foreign Affairs. And Zsuzsa is currently conducting research on how autocratic um, types of national uh, politics are shaping the future of the European Union. Stefano Bottoni is, uh, as a, as a, is an associate professor of history at the University of Florence in the Department of History, Archaeology, Geography, Art, and Entertainment. I got the English title, I'm sorry. Um, and he has published two books about um, Eastern European history, which were translated into English. The first of which is uh, titled Long Awaited uh, West, Eastern Europe since uh, 1944 came out from Indiana in 2017. And the second one is Stalin's legacy in Romania, uh, the Hungarian Autonomous Region, 1950 to 1960, which was published by Lexington a year later. Uh, most part, uh, mo and most pertinent to our discussion today is uh, Professor Bottoni also uh, published a book, uh, first in Italian, that came out in 19, uh, 2019, about uh, Hungary's prime minister. The English title, if I translate it into English, is something like uh, a despot in Europe. And then he expanded, revised and expanded it and published it in Hungarian in, 19, in 2023. My understanding is that the book, um, that you had a hard time finding a publisher, but then the book has been selling really well since then. And I wanted to close this introduction by congratulating both of you on these two books. I, re I read them. Uh, I read them and I, enjoyment is kind of a strange uh, word to use in this context because the topic is so depressing, but I immensely uh, appreciated um, the meticulous research that the books were um, based on and also your mental and, in, and intellectual and psychological stamina and strength to study and write about something that is so controversial and so um, Orban is is uh, Orban Victor is a is an upsetting political figure, and um, 
So I, I very much appreciate it. I very much appreciated your books. Um, all right, uh, then back to Erica, the first yeah. question. So I'll, I'll, I'll start us off. Um, th so this is a series on EU enlargement, kind of commemorating the 20th anniversary of um, the Big Bang, if you will, um, enlargement. And so I wanted to kind of make sure or for, for those who had different um, backgrounds to kind of give a background on what that process, in, process of enlargement looked like for Hungary. Um, what, how would you describe Hungary's path to EU integration? Um, was it, you know, not it, kind of almost taking away what we see now, but what was it like, um, you know, 20 years ago when they were trying to, when Hungary was trying to come into the, the to the European Union and what that looked like? So I will allow either of you to kind of take a stab at that question. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm a bit older than Stefano. So I, I, and I remember some things which you cannot, you just could study this. So very welcome everyone. I'm very happy to uh, be here though. I cannot see you, but I, I hope uh, we will provide some in, interesting insight. So I just would like to say a couple of things about like around the, um, the period which basically followed the, the big transition. So when Hungary became a free country as after 18, 1989 and 1990, when we had the first uh, free elections. And um, this period and the following 15 years uh, until Hungary became the EU member was uh, characterized uh, a significantly a consensual politics of what what regards foreign policy. Uh, there were many, many disagreements how the new Hungary should look like, but there was basically no disagreement about major political actors and the entire Hungarian elite that the reference point is the West, uh, that the strategic aim of so securing Hungary's position uh, is in the transatlantic alliance, catching up to uh, to the West, integrating Hungary to and at the entire Central European region to Western Europe, economically, politically, culturally. Though Hungarians always regarded themselves as a European country, which Hungary's history uh, is a proof of. Uh, but obviously, the communist period, we did we were not part of this the Western family. So this this was very very important and each and every Hungarian government uh, during this process, during these 15 years followed this policy. Uh, Hungarians also regarded themselves together with the post like the most developed Eastern European uh, uh, country to, to join the EU as soon as possible, which did not happen because all the countries actually, most of them were uh, um, get entry to the EU in uh, 2004. Um, but, but it was a it's a very consensual politics. What what is interesting maybe to to see that there were some uh, the attitudes the uh, attitudes around European identity around the period when Hungary joined the EU uh, were formed by various factors mainly the kind of expectation and this was an elite expectation for to, to for getting resources and modernize hungary especially the economy also provide a better well-being for uh for for the citizens for the people so it was a kind of material uh interest there was political and human freedoms probably also a kind of elite expectation uh, a kind of national pride so that we are part of the West. We are part of the most developed part of the world. We are, uh, that, that's an important element. But party preferences were also somewhat different. And Hungary specifically is a country with, where ethno-nationalism was also characterizing, especially the right-wing voters, but it has a strong uh, roots in Hungary. So interestingly, uh, this the question whether national pride pride was characterized by by this ethnic element 
and whether it was more kind of expecting modernization created somewhat more pro-European and less pro-European, but altogether the society also was quite pro-European, it still is. But this is an interesting uh, element of, of some the the attitudes which can explain a lot what was happening uh, in Hungary ever since. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, anything to add? Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and for this opportunity. Uh, it, it is really a privilege for me to be here and she was totally right. Uh, she was there. Uh, I was not. Uh, although I, I also remember I was a young man, 2004, 20 years ago. Uh, we were standing uh, uh, in the uh, Hero Square in Budapest and watching the fireworks on May Day uh, 2004 when Hungary also joined the EU. And uh, it was a big moment for me and, and for many people many, 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 many other people together. But historically speaking, uh, Zhuzh is totally right that uh, it was an elite project. Uh, it was a shared project uh, from a foreign, pol foreign policy point of view. I would add that it was also the last really shared project of the Hungarian political elite. Hungarian political elite uh, started working on EU integration. They didn't call it that way. They called it Western integration or or, or something like this. We, we being a central European country, not a Soviet country. So detaching Hungary from the Balkans and from the post-Soviet sphere, they started working on it in the very early 1990s. And the right, center and left were basically united, united in the idea that there is no alternative to the Western path and the Western path is desirable for Hungary and for the Hungarian citizens. And uh, I just finished a book on, 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 on the history of Hungary in the last one, 150 years. And uh, I used a strange periodization uh, which, in which 1989 is not so much the, the turning point in the recent history of Hungary. And I tried to, to make a new periodization, which starts from the second half of the 1960s as a long period of opening to the West. And when I had to put an end to this period, unfortunately, I put it exactly in 2004. <laughs> so 2004 is a very paradoxical moment for Hungary, because on the one side, you have the complexion of the you were Atlantic integration. Hungary joined NATO in 1999, joined the EU uh, in May 2004. So what's next? So what kind of problem we can have? So we are now part of the big Euro Atlantic family. That was precisely the moment when uh, the Hungarian political elite found out that they didn't have any other shared projects of national integration. They could have been uh, integration of Roma communities, uh, uh, poverty in the countryside, uh, uh, peripheries in the larger cities, a lot of things. There were a lot of social economic problems to tackle, and they they just forgot about it. They just forgot about tackling, and they started to quarrel about power. So the years between 2004 and the big economic crisis which very severely affect, affected Hungary in 2008, 2009. These were precisely the years of a latent disease of the Hungarian democracy. And also uh, uh, made people much less aware of all the advantages of the EU. So I would say, I, I would say that for the average Hungarians, 2004 was important, but maybe Joining Schengen, so the Schengen Free Movement Zone in December 2007, that was really the moment when average Hungarians understood, okay, we got here. We don't need even an ID or a passport to show anyone to go to Vienna or to go to, to some other places in the European Union. That was very important. On the other side, and we can maybe discuss about this later, uh, 
Hungary joined the EU along with a lot of other countries in 2004, but the EU budget until 2007 was already set up and there was no money for that. There was basically no money put into the EU integration until I would say 2008. The big money started to come to Hungary and Poland and Czech Republic and to the other countries much later. And that was precisely uh, a moment of weakness, uh, which was lately exploited by populist parties and uh, Eurosceptic movements, because it was the moment, moment when they said, OK, but there is no money. There is no advantage. We had to open our markets, which happened. Hungary had to open uh, its internal market and for a very open economy. Uh, Hungary is a very open economy, which means uh, the Hungarian economy is an uh, export-driven economy, and it was like this since the 1970s and 80s. Hungary was by far the most open economy of the Soviet bloc, so it, it's not a novelty, but it can be a problem when you have a when, when you cannot finance yourself. So public deficit spending, uh, uh, external debt, and uh, the Hungarian rates were very uh, Hungarian figures were very bad in the 1990s, and they were bad again around 2006 and 7 and 8, and there was no money. So I, I think that the project, the solidity of the integration project was undermined from the very first moment by the fact that there was no real money put into it. And the mechanism, so the EU just thought that it is like a machine, you start the engine, and then the machine will will we'll, we'll, we'll go through the way because we have a path. And that was this moment when, when Hungary started to lose the path, exactly after the, the EU accession in 2004. This is my take. I have a follow-up question, but Gabby, I can- No, you're fine. Please go ahead. No, so, I, you know, is it, is it, you know, when you're talking about who they are, right? Is it, was it rising expectations on the part of elites? Or, or did that trickle down to the everyday citizen and saying, wait a minute, we thought we were going to get some money out of this. We, we, you know, we had certain expectations that that the EU is kind of then faltering in terms of letting us down in terms of what we were, you know, getting into. Or was that more, you know, was it both elite and citizen level? And did that then lay the path for you know, this populism, you know, that, that, ca that came after that? Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, uh, so I think the people, uh, from the people's side, I mean, a kind of, a, 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 if there is any average citizen, which I don't think yeah, there right. is, but anyway, the non-elite, they, you know, they were ex expecting a kind of raising living standard. So this is how it, it looks. So and then uh, also the in this period, which uh, in the two thousands basically, Hungary was uh, was a leading country in the region economically uh, over the nineties, uh, but by the end of the century, uh, the other countries catched up to to the level of Hungary. So we lost the advantage, and it seemed that we are not progressing. So this was something like uh, like um, you know. If, if there were elite uh, unhappiness uh, and certain political forces wanted to abuse that the EU is not as it we hoped for or looked like, uh, then there was some, some argument in it. And I think I can support what uh, Stefano said in, in this regard that, but it, whether, whether this was because the money didn't come right away, uh, I don't think that the political fight started then, I think, there were the polarization of Hungarian politics was much earlier. And I think it's also something important also today. It has long, long uh, reasons and but we don't have time to go in why is it that, but mm -hmm. by the 2000s, this, this very uh, sharp uh, competition between the, by the time bipolar political arena uh, was really uh, uh, very intensive and this was this is something which make Hungary different from other Eastern European countries and this is basically it has historic reasons but it also has 
uh, it's also because of uh, we have a, a majoritarian electoral system, a winner takes all system, which is absolutely not typical in Europe. Yes, uh, I totally agree that, uh, especially since 2002, when uh, current Prime Minister Viktor Orban uh, lost uh, rather unexpectedly uh, the elections uh, after four years in government. So his first, go first government uh, lasted since 1998-2002, and then he lost uh, to the socialist liberal uh, coalition that governed Hungary until 2010. And uh, he barely ac accepted uh, the electoral defeat. Uh, there was even some popular unrest, which was very, very uncommon in Hungary. Hungary was a tremendously peaceful country uh, from the point of view of no social activism. So even in 1989, uh, the Hungarian 1989 was very different uh, in the streets from the East German, Czech, uh, even Polish, not to speak about Romania 1989. Uh, so it was really a elite, uh, elite revolution, a negotiated revolution, something very different. And the Hung most Hungarians were happy with it at, the, at that time. But it, Starting from 2002, the two political blocs, so we could call them the, the socialist liberals and the nationalist or conservatives, they basically questioned the, the legitimacy of each other, which was a, which, which was a kind of a, a new step in the polarization of the, of, the, uh, of the political arena. We could also say sometimes uh, political scientists call Hungary a laboratory for many things, uh, just as Austria, but unfortunately in a much more radical way. So in Austria, they try things we are able to realize. So they had Haider, but it lasted very, very short. Our Haider is, is much more uh, resistant, uh, resilient. So uh, Hungary became a laboratory for this kind of uh, uh, political struggle and uh, the economic side couldn't really counter it as a stabilizing, stabilizing factor. When you, when you say, okay, we have a rough political arena, but at least the economy is doing well, we, 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 we can achieve stability through it. The problem is that uh, if, you, if you look at the economic transition in Hungary, it looked a very successful tran transition economy in the in the early 2000s. It was a market economy. It was kind of functioning, and every every agency kind of uh, put the stamp on this. And then, starting 2004, five, six, you have uh, a declining economy. Hungary, as 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 Juja mentioned, losing ground to Poland. Slovakia, and then even Romania. So this kind of idea in the Hungarians, we are not the Balkans, we are much better than the Balkans, we are Central Europe. And then you say, and, and then you see the so-called Balkans kind of approaching you and starting its own catching up. Uh, um, and then you lose ground. And I think that this is part of the story uh, that took Viktor Orban into power again in 2010, under very different conditions and with a very different program, because in 2010, he, his program was not uh, revitalizing Hungary on the old grounds of the post-1989 democracy, mm -hmm. but the program was undoing the 1989 democracy, post-1989 democracy, and setting up something totally different. So to, to bring this up to the present, I was, uh, and to kind of understand Hungary's uh, place in the European Union, we need to talk a little bit about how Orban's Eurosceptic Euro position has evolved. Both of you discuss nationalism in your books, uh, the emphasis of, uh, on national sovereignty over federalism, and um, what you could describe as a pervasive uh, victimhood complex, uh, Zsuzsa calls it the ideology of uh, victimhood, right? So I was wondering if you could say a little bit about how Orban's Eurosceptic position evolved and whether this is about Orban astutely tapping um, Hungarians' disappointment with Hungary's incorporation into the European Union as, uh, as a, a kind of new supplier of uh, cheap and unprotected, unprotected, unprotected labor, 
while Orban uh, actively um, contributes to this uh, of, of disempowering labor, for instance. So okay, the question so that's, yeah. that's many questions. Oh no! But, so um, yeah, maybe just the, how Euroscepticism yeah. evolved so and the, added, yeah. I think that there is, as I said, in in the the right wing political mentality, the uh, the and the nationalist stance is typically uh, it's very typical for for some political parties in the in Europe which uh, mm -hmm. are just more Eurosceptic. So they're, they're basically not very fond of a more federal Europe in general. But but of course, or in Orban's case is, is different. And um, there are other personal and and some national elements. The, the, the one is Orban's personality, which is a part of, uh, of what is happening in Hungary. Uh, it, Obviously, he he builds on on certain uh, popular feelings and the status of Eastern Europe, Central Europe within the EU, EU's periphery. So this victimhood starts from 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 this this uh, uh, place of Hungary on the map. Uh, but but obviously there is something which is very specific for Orban. I mean, his incredible personal drive to be a leader of something to be an influential person, in, be more influential than what actually the size of Hungary would allow within the EU, which is a small country. I mean, many small countries in the EU, but Hungary is 10 million. And uh, normally 10 million countries can make a, a real in, input on Europe's life and Europe's future when they are very rich. So Hungary is not a rich of 10 million, so it doesn't have a much say. But Orban doesn't believe this should be like this. So that's, there's a personality element. And then there is this, this kind of Central European um, feeling of second class. We are the periphery, we are the poorer. It's very easy to spark kind of resentment wherever, anywhere in Eastern Europe out of this politics. So it's not very special to Orban, but he is very, he can express it in a very, harsh, open, and and also sophisticated manner. Many people in Eastern Europe agree uh, with Orban because he dares to state that we are not second-class citizens. So there is also this, this kind of uh, mental element of the story. And the third one, which which is um, a new thing and follows what Stefano said about the kind of demise of the 2000s, is the 2008 crisis, which came only four years after we joined the EU. So for many people uh, who did not felt, you know, the big the added value of being an EU member uh, because of their life did not, you know, the, the, the Canaan didn't come to Hungary within these two years, with these few years, even more, we got this very, very deep crisis uh, in 2008, 2009. And this was also, and now this is something that it's pretty clear today, but it was not so clear back then, how big change in the world this crisis initiated or demonstrated. And But Orban took it very early on that this is a big crisis of the Western liberal world. Uh, this was in parallel of growing the BRICS countries. In the 2000s, we saw uh, big uh, big countries in the globe emerging economically uh, obviously we know we know that it's, it also meant the political kind of influence growing of influence as well but but he he saw it that it's a something big is changing the way, the world setup will not be as it was until now and because he got to power with this super majority and i think this is important that we talk about he got 52% of the popular vote. But because of the uh, disproportional uh, profile of the Hungarian election system, this meant that he got 67% uh, of the parliament mandate, which means everything. It's a constitutional power. And Fidesz party, Orban's party, changed the constitution within one year and changed everything. Orban actually announced a revolution in 2010. And we didn't know what this would mean, but we know quite a lot by now. 
So this whole thing, he understood, he is so strong. He has such a legitimacy. He has a constitutional power. No one can stop him in Hungary. And he felt that, okay, probably no one can stop me in, you know, in Europe either, because no one else has such a big power. And he does, he has this power for 14 years now. So this, this is a compact that, and then the understanding that things are changing and there's much more room for maneuvering. And if you are fast and quick and understand the weaknesses of the others, you can change a completely different politics and we can make an influence. I think this was the momentum uh, which Orban put together. He openly spoke about the decline of the West. He um, lost an old politics which we can speak about a little bit now but i i uh, give a word to to stefano uh, so this this was a complete new setup and he really started to make hungary a laboratory again in terms of foreign policy if 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 the big powers do not work as they did before if there is a kind of moving around there are the middle powers why not a small power politics can also be uh demonstrated and that that's what he started uh with this uh launching of the eastern opening i'd like to turn uh our conversation a little bit on the on the eu side as well uh because uh a very interesting issue is okay uh hungary was not doing so well uh economically but even politically before 20, 2010, so before Orban came to power and was doing even worse politically since 2010. So an interesting question could be, okay, how did Brussels react to the challenge coming from the periphery? Uh, it is very important to understand that the EU, so we used to call the EU an empire by invitation. Uh, we don't have to fear the word empire, which seems now a little bit shaky, uh, morally speaking, but uh, the EU is a very peaceful empire, uh, the most peaceful empire we we, 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 we could really imagine, uh, so much that it has no military power at all, so which can become a problem uh, as we see it now. But the EU, uh, and it was intended as, a, as an elite club, it used to be an elite club until the 1990s, when very rich countries like Austria or Finland joined. And of course, the problems posed by the accession of countries like Finland or Austria were not even comparable to the challenges posed by Poland, Hungary, and later, not to speak about Romania or Bulgaria, Bulgaria or other people, uh, candidate countries now. The point is that the EU has no exit strategy, never had any exit strategy, strategy if you want to join the club. You are, of course, allowed not to join the club. Norway, for example, was a country which very politely said no to the EU accession. The EU just accepted it. We have seen with the Brexit how tremendously painful and uh, from a certain point of view, a lose-lose situation uh, such a separation can be. In the case of Hungary, my impression was always that when they started to realize that this Orban guy is a little bit strange, doing strange things like this new constitution, two thirds of a uh, majority, which becomes 100% of power uh, and so on and so forth, 22. 2011, 2012, 2013, so still during the first uh, term in power uh, before 2014. So they started thinking about, and what they elaborated is what two political scientists, Andra Shegedush and, uh, and, um, and uh, no, Dania Hegedush and Andra Bozoki called uh, soft external constraint, which basically means it's better to keep the autocrats inside the EU, trying to influencing them and trying to moderating them. If I would be more harsh, I would say trying to appease them with some money, 
with some stick and carrots, then to imagine, then imagining to kick them out and risking to create a security issue, a security threat. This is how they basically dealt with Viktor Orban until I would say at least 2022. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel is the person who brought this policy to perfection. And I think that her historical role will be evaluated in a very, very critical way. And this is, this is so problematic for many Europeans because uh, she was the most powerful people in Europe for 15 years. Uh, she was widely perceived as the leader of a peaceful, democratic, self-reflective, and so on and so forth, Europe. And now we see the tremendous effects of her personal failure and the failure of Germany as a leading country with regard to Russia and also Hungary. Hungary is part of the problem with Russia because the big appeasement with, with Russia was also the smaller but not less significant for us appease, appeasement policy with Hungary. It brought, it brought back nothing to Hungary because the Hungarian democracy, I would say, steadily declined until 2018. And then it started to decline even more rapidly over the last couple of years. And so we, we now have a, a stamp on the world uh, on the hybrid regime, uh, more soft autocracy stuff. So we can't really say Hungary is a democracy, not even an illiberal one. That's right. Uh, and nothing happened basically until they put in, uh, in force some sanction. And the only way the EU has to sanction a country, especially from the semi-periphery like Hungary, getting more money from the EU budget than, than, the, than the money they put into it is, okay, there is no money. Let's try with the, with the, with the technique. We don't give you any money. Just to put for, for an American audience this into context, Brussels has given Hungary over the last 20 years, roughly 70 billion euros Maybe it's 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 comparable in, in 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 U.S. dollars, just in terms of of cohesion funds. Hungary is not a big country, seventy billion euros. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. So this is what uh, the awful Brussels bureaucrats have done to Hungary. It was a huge amount of money. And now they are keeping some part of this money money away from Hungary. So, so now they are putting some, some not so soft constraint, but we are still in speaking about a very, very polite form of imposing some discipline. So this is the maximum the EU in its institutional construction has in a case they they really didn't foresee. They, they really didn't foresee the possibility that a, a member country behaves so badly. Because Hungary, in, in Italy, at least in Italy, we have in the Italian press uh, this stereotypical view that, oh, these Eastern European countries were not really ready in 2004 when they joined. I would say it's false. I would contend that Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia were not only technically, they were working democracies in, democracies in 2004. They fully deserved to be part of the EU. They were okay. There was no bribery in the way they accessed the EU. The problems started not before 2004 from this point of view. The start, problems started later. Yeah, so we have a question from the um, from from Jan, um, and his question is: um, Is the strategy of appeasing autocrats the same strategy during EU's relations to Russia? Well, back or now, right? I don't think today it was. It was for for many years. I think uh, I I completely agree with Stefano. This was, uh, this was, uh, you know, Russia. Uh, has been a major energy supplier for many European countries. The closer you are 
uh, to Russia, the, the more dependent you were on Russia. And the, this is just, that was the closest and cheapest uh, energy source, for example, uh, for Hungary, but also for the Slovakia, Austria, uh, Germany. Uh, so the more Western parts buy their energy resources from elsewhere. But but altogether, Europe received a very significant part on from Russia and relatively good and cheap price because that's close, much closer than LNG from the US or the Middle East or wherever. So it's it's still actually the cheapest. So this this was one major reason. And there were all, all kind of cultural reasons why, especially German politics was uh, very um, friendly and appeasing uh, towards Russia, also for historic reasons and, and also traditional historic, I mean, hundreds of years, Russian and German politicians regarded themselves as, as big European powers uh, and had certain relations, but also in in uh, because of the Second World War. So there were all kind of moral elements out of this, which we can also see now with German's politics vis-a-vis -vis Israel. It's very complicated. So there are many reasons. And I think we can definitely blame Merkel for for the politics she led for 16 years uh, with Russia, um, but uh, it's not the case any longer. I mean, but of course, it's not fixed yet. There is no one unified EU policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia in these days. Though I think Europe made huge advancement uh, with the sanction politics and and basically providing. Uh, EU membership to Ukraine and Moldova, and recently providing a, a 50 billion uh, um, euro uh, fund uh, for the survival, the physical survival of, of Ukraine. So these are incredible big steps, which no one could imagine just a couple of years ago. So I think there is an awareness uh, in the European political elite that that we have to take care of this and Russia politics is, is significantly changed. But if you look uh, around uh, very concrete governmental politics, then then of course, and public, the public opinion, then there are the wide variety. And we can see that that people in the Nordics, in, in Poland, uh, in the Baltic country, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, uh, they are very, uh, um, Obviously, security, their security is is more um, relevant. Uh, the Russia's closeness is as the most poses the most security risk for them. So they are very critical and very tough on Russia politics. They are the ones who are uh, initiating the new sanction packages. Uh, and then there are some countries, uh, um, Bulgaria or Hungary or Austria and Germany, where the population is much, much uh, uh, more uh, diverse and a lot of people believe that somehow we have to get to an agreement to Russia. So the political elite idea of, or policy, which is very pro-Ukrainian, no, we don't speak about Hungary yet in this case, uh, and the public is not completely aligned. And this is a big issue now in Europe because of course, uh, in this year when there will be so many elections, uh, it's it's not very easy to explain to many Europeans that what exactly means uh, standing by Ukraine, it, which costs a lot of money, uh, which means a lot of uh, Ukrainians are in Europe as as uh, refugees, millions of people uh, in many countries. This poses uh, home crisis. Uh, uh, you know, in, in the in the Netherlands, for example, not only in Poland and the Czech Republic. So there is not enough. Uh, place to live because there are so many uh, refugees. So there are a lot of things which are weakening, uh, weakening Europe's commitment uh, on uh, on Ukraine and the tough toughness on Russia. But but I think there so far it's it's quite a good uh, and and surprisingly strong uh, politics on on Russia from the EU. And of course Hungary has a very special role, which. If you are interested, we can also discuss a bit more detail. Gabby, did you have a, a follow-up question? No, no, I was in, I was going to ask. I think we could. I would love yeah, to know more about uh, Hungary's Russia Russia policy because that kind of seems to be a little bit breaking down. I thought what Juja said about 
Orban using, I forget the exact term, but the kind of that he, it, in your book, you was also discuss uh, Orban taking a lot of risk. Both of you discussed this, a lot of risk in his uh, foreign policies, right? In terms of uh, using populism also as a political style. But that seems to be breaking down with uh, with, with what happened uh, with the most recent uh, European Commission issue, the uh, Sweden's joining the NATO and Hungary using its veto power. And Hungary is trying to do that, trying to negotiate something, but obviously not failing to do that. And um, so that's a little bit changing. And I was wondering about uh, also about um, Hungary's Russia friendly policy, foreign policy, and how that deterior deteriorated the country's relationship not only with other Europe, but with other uh, countries within the region, the East Central European region. Um, yeah, anything you would want to say about this, or you would want to share with us about this? How you see this? Where is this going? Today? Yes. Today okay. in, in two minutes. In two oh, minutes. two minutes. Okay. Oh, no, I'm kidding. Um, I'm just we're running out of time. Don't worry. Uh, at times, I feel that it is not so easy to find the rationale beyond it, to be very honest. Uh, we can understand what Erdogan do, uh, does, for example, when, uh, when he blocked uh, Sweden's accession, he wanted money. We can blame people for uh, one. Uh, 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 willing some more money from NATO, but uh, at least it is a very clear tactics. Orban didn't ask any more money. Orban didn't ask explicitly any more territories. We we couldn't really find a strategic goal beyond blocking this accession for years. So our working hypotheses are, first, this guy and this political elite has been blackmailed. So someone in Moscow must have a very serious compromise on him and them, and they are able to use the compromise at any time, which means that these people are no longer sovereign political actors. The first or the second, they can be combined. The second is they have very important political interests in keeping their ties with Russia so strong. So they are part of an illegal Russian transnational economy, and they are profiting from it. Uh, the third, which is not better, not, not at all better as an hypothesis, is that some of the people in the government really believe what they say. So they really came over the last 10, 15 years to align themselves ideologically, psychologically, to the Putinist vision and the Putinist state of mind of the so-called collective West, which is something I, I feel always terrible about when, when I hear it. When I hear Orban and the state media and these people speaking about the collective West as if Hungary was not part of the West, but we are something different, we don't know what, but something different, it is a mental detaching that has no precedence in the Hungarian political thinking and the Hungarian political practice since I would say the 1970s or 80s, when the Western consensus came into being. So I think that this is the most troubling and, uh, thing because if we speak about money and corruption, they exist. If we speak about the compromise, historians will find it out in 50 years. But when we speak about corrupting minds. And when we speak about being able through state propaganda and media to influence the population and make millions of Hungarians believe that Russia, this kind of Russia, not Russia as the Russian writers and the great Russian literature, but this Russia doing these things in Ukraine concretely day by day is our friend and ally. And Ukraine is, a, is, is not a proper nation. So they are really believing what they say, that Ukraine is not a proper nation, like Stalin's definition of nation 1913, not a proper nation, not a stable community of people. They don't deserve to exist as a nation. Russia is our friend. Oh, they are a puppet regime of, of Washington, of course. And they are Nazis, of course. And they are also Jews in some case. So Jew, Jewish Nazis, which is the 
the most perverse combination you could imagine. I think that at least some of these people really now believe what they say. And as a partly Hungarian, this is the part of the story which really troubles me because uh, corrupting through money is, is morally de despicable. But this kind of mental corruption is the most terrible thing that happened to Hungary over the last 10 years, I think. Okay, can I just add something? And I saw there is another yes. question. Yes. So, uh, because um, I agree very much uh, with the Stefano on the, that, that, this, that there are some relationship between the Hungarian current polit top political elite, which is Viktor Orban and his, uh, and his elite is a narrow bunch of people. Uh, that they have special personal gains from this Russian relationship. We don't know exactly what, because everything is secret, but there are so many big business going on in Russia on energy and gas trade on nuclear, uh, a new nuclear plant is built in Hungary. So there are many others, even if there's no compromise, there's enough reason why uh, this urban system is directly linked somehow to the top, uh, Putin system, and I use this term to differentiate between Russia from Putin's regime. Uh, so definitely there is something, and we will know that at some point, I, I also believe. I do not believe Orban likes Putin because he doesn't like anyone who is stronger and have bigger power than him. And he traditionally never believed that Russia is a good uh, ally, uh, he I my observation is or analyzes is that he believes he can play with Russia. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the West, he can get out of the most out of this relationship, and probably his by wanting getting out of the most, he was probably somehow um, you know got into this unseen network but there what i want to say is that orban really wants hungary or himself he's hungry uh very influential and he only can do this if he is in the center of something since we are not the center of the eu we are at the periphery of the eu we can be only in the center if if there, we open to the west and create relationships so we gain negotiation potential and balancing power and this is this leads his politics. And, uh, and the problem with Ukraine, and then we, 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 if you do not only analyze Russia relationship, but also Ukraine's, then a new Ukraine within the European Union is it's just not serving this game of Orban because Ukraine is much bigger than Hungary. It's, uh, it's uh, if it's in 15, 20 years, if Ukraine is integrated and hopefully the war will be over and Ukraine is in, integrated in the EU, then, then it will be much stronger and bigger than Hungary. Orban recently explained to a number of European partners that there is a new alliance, a Nordic alliance, where the Nordic countries and Poland and Ukraine creates a new kind of force field uh, which really um, uh, disadvantages to his idea of where hung what role Hungary should play in the future of Europe. So I think it's very complicated. It's very complex, and that, but, but definitely he's not going with the mainstream Europe. And of course, when it, this unity in a war situation is it's so important and so strategic, then Orbán's be behavior is deeply troubling, especially for us Hungarians because he's leading Hungary now. So, but this is a super interesting question and uh, we will still talk a lot about that and try to reveal what's exactly behind this is rather uh, unrooted politics, as, as you said, Stefano, that it's really out of the, the Hungarian a tradition of, of thinking of Hungary and Russia. Maybe just I can say a few words on, 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 a, on a Polish question. 
Yes, I, I was going to say mind. that would be a nice, good. So I'll just read the question real quick so that everyone can see it. Mm -hmm. You know, are there lessons <laughs> Hungarian society and the Hungarian opposition can learn from the recent Polish elections? Uh, so Poland, as as you probably know, had an election when, when the joint opposition forces uh, led by Donald uh, Tusk were, were able to... Uh, create a bigger coalition than than the previous government. Uh, and the, actually there was a change of, of government and they toppled the uh, the rather populist, nationalist, uh, conservative uh, government, which was in good relationship with Viktor Orban's Hungary and also built Poland towards an illiberal type of country, though it they used a lot of illiberal practices, but but the, this previous government coalition was never so strong as Orban uh, is in Hungary. So, uh, well, it's a, it's a super interesting question. I think we can talk about a lot, lot why Hungary's situation is different from hung Hungary's. Uh, and because of it's a, a different electoral system, it was a coalition government. Uh, which, we, which we do not have. We have a one party government, which is a much bigger power. And, and of course, Orban is in power now for 14th year. He changed the constitution. He, he deeply reshaped the Hungarian political, economic, and cultural arena during this 14 years, which did not happen in Poland. Also the complete in media environment. So it's, it's much deeper illiberal system than Poland ever was. In Poland, there was always a vi uh, viable alternative there were significant po uh, opposition forces which were no successful. Uh, what we can learn from them is is uh, that opposition should not fra fragment in such a situation, but get together. And I think the Hungarian government or opposition is aware of this, but it's super complicated. It's a much smaller opposition as much more fragmented. And there's a lot of tricks this government Orban's government is completely changing the frames the rules of the game in order to puzzle the opposition to create an uh, a competitive environment when they are just not interested not able to cooperate successfully so and this did not happen in Poland at all so the constitutional setup of Poland an electoral system was never never changed so, uh, but of course, the, the idea is there. And of course, uh, there's a lot to learn about how to mobilize people, how to use the, the mistakes of the government or the uh, illiberal uh, forces uh, for the better. There's a lot of learning points, but the situation is just very, very different. And, and it's much more complicated uh, for the Hungarian opposition, which has, of course, a lot of weaknesses and problems. Uh, but the environment is just is not as favorable as it was in Poland. Yes, I think we have time for one more comment. Stefano, would you uh, like to? Oh, just a sh just a very short follow up to to what Juja uh, uh, said. I totally agree with Poland. I, I I'm uh, I also think that these are two totally different countries and situations. Unfortunately, not in our favor. So, which means that uh, the situation of Poland is is was much more favorable and uh, and uh, we can't really expect Hungary uh, uh, to be able to follow it because we have a totally different social uh, uh, structure. Uh, just a just a short uh, ending uh, remark on on Hungary, Russia, and playing between great powers. I'm a historian. The last time the Hungarian political elite tried something something uh, uh, similar between 1941 and 1944 with the Nazis, pretending to be the smarter guys in the room, being able uh, to be a uh, uh, faithful ally without committing to the German war on annihilation and trying to balance uh, with the Western powers, it ended very, very bad. The Hungarian political elite is not really able to do it. And the least they try with this kind of balancing within between great powers, the uh, the better is. So this is what really worries me because historical lessons should be at least learned to try to avoid some further errors. Well, 
Thank you. That's a good ending um, remark. And I want to thank all of the panelists and uh, my fellow moderator and to remind everyone that our next um, EU enlargement conversation will be on March 28th, in which we'll be talking about Malta and Cyprus. Um, so thank you again, and thank you for all of the um, participants who joined us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.